Hello and welcome to Big Deal. I'm Nisha Podar. Now, today on the show, I have with me two large global DFIs or development finance institutions, which are very active in India and focusing on investing with impact, which is, remember, at the heart of DFI style of investment. Let me welcome on the show today Neha Grover of International Finance Corporation and Srini Nagarajan of British International uh, Investment. Uh, so good to have you on CNBC TV 18, both of you. Srini, beginning with you, for a country like India developing you with huge potential, how do you see the role of DFIs here? Thank you, Nisha. It's an absolute pleasure to be talking to you on this session, and thank you for organizing this. As you know, BII is wholly owned by the UK government, and the world's oldest DFI yes. has been in existence for the last 75 years and comes under what is called Foreign Commonwealth and Development Office. And we play a central role in the UK government's international offering. India is a recognized, globally recognized investment destination today. Capital does not seem to be a constraint at this point in time. Hence, it's important that development institutions play a much more catalytic role in nature to stimulate private capital to come into those projects that are relatively risky for commercial investors to come uh, at, at this particular juncture. In addition, I think mobilization is a very important part of our theme for all the development financial institutions, including like, uh, like us. One thing very critical is we are very sensitive to crowding out private capital. We, uh, we invest where there is that there isn't a ready supply of private finance to bring about a positive economic and environmental change. Hmm. Second important point, Nisha, is we all measure the impact. We have a very sophisticated framework which has the parameters like productivity, sustainability, and inclusion, right? So in substance, I would say DFIs in India have to constantly reevaluate the position to make sure that they are additive and not crowding out private capital but equally play their role and being inclusive and unsustainable. Hmm. In other words, we need to push our boundaries to keep our development impact goals in mind, hmm. and we have to take greater risks. All I think in, in, that's very critical. Let me stop there. All right, Srini. So um, you set the stage beautifully and uh, great thoughts on what a vision of a DFI is and especially its importance in India. Neha, jump into this discussion. What do you have to add to the fact that India already is getting a lot of uh, capital? A lot of foreign investors are really looking at India as a growth potential area of future. But a lot of sectors that actually need that private investment are still still underserved. Do you think that the role of DFIs is critically on those areas and for inclusive growth? So thanks, thanks, Nisha. Um, thanks for having me here. So I think the critical aspect here, the way I look at it is uh, the, the role of a DFI is to uh, develop the ecosystem of the country across different sectors, across different time uh, timelines. Uh, we are here to support businesses. We are here to contribute to job creation. Um, to climate sort of uh, initiatives, and I think if you if you take a if you take a step back, you need capital, but you also need expertise. You need international benchmarks. You need somebody to come in and give a signal of a vote of confidence to private capital, saying, "Hey, we are here. We've done the background. We've done the uh, uh, sort of uh, basic work, and now we think this this sort of space it has uh, enough and more uh, uh, sort of juice for you to come in." Uh, and give, we give confidence to private capital to come in. I think, um, and let's take the example of the private equity uh, space in India or the microfinance space in India. I've seen started investing uh, in the microfinance space, for example, uh, very early on when microfinance had just started and companies were getting seeded about two decades ago. We were one of the most prolific investors here. And once the ecosystem got developed, the space developed, uh, companies sort of grew, they've now, most of them have gotten small finance bank licenses, et cetera. We took a step back and said, okay, now this ecosystem is developed, let private capital come in and let them now take the commercial role of taking it, scaling it up to the next level. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think it's important to see that India is a very complex country. Uh, there is no one size fits all for capital. Uh, for each space at different points in time, you require different kinds of capital. And the yes. role of DFIs changes over time. Yes. Uh, so what we did two decades ago will not be something that we focus on today. 
and we keep evolving our strategy uh, based on this. That's right. Both, uh, both of you, Srini and Neha, you have uh, emphatically pointed out that the role keeps changing. Srini, why don't you highlight at this juncture, how is the change in theme as well as the focus shifting? I think fundamentally, uh, you know, uh, what exactly, so what is necessary here is inclusion. See, as far as India is concerned, if you ask me where DFIs like us have to focus, it's on two main pillars. One is inclusion, the other one is climate. Because what happens is when you start addressing climate, inclusion should not be forgotten. For example, our inclusion is, is, is predicated on addressing, it's very important who we understand who benefits from our money. With that section of the population which has a disposable income of, for example, $6.8 per day in PPP terms, uh, which, is a, which, is, which is a new poverty line which has been defined by World Bank, is that section of the population where we try to focus. And I think that's very critical. So on the heart of building a sustainable and inclusive business lies the need to also advance the gender equality through women's empowerment. Because if you try and look at India, women in formal employment is still uh, a, you know, a low number vis-a-vis -vis other Asian countries, especially Southeast Asia. And I think we focus on women women as leaders, employees, entrepreneurs, suppliers, customers, and we have also signed up to the Global 2X Challenge, which we, we, you know, we were a proponent right from the beginning. And I think both in terms of inclusion and climate and our policy on responsible investing and our impact management are actually the pillars of what we do. The second point I want to emphasize is when we try to invest in a country like India, where we are addressing different section of the population which really needs our money, having different pools of capital is extremely valuable. For example, we have a pool of capital which is called growth. We also have a pool of capital which is called catalytic, which where we do blended finance transactions. Right. So blending, blending money in investments where commercial investors are slightly wary to come in at this stage because of the higher levels of risk is very critical in a, in a, in a, in a, in a, in a country like India where things are evolving very quickly. And for example, on the climate side, the government has a huge ambition of 500 gigawatts by 2030. So newer concepts, if you blend it and bring it to a certain stage where commercial investors and you make it attractive for them, that'll be quite valuable. So the different pools of capital are extremely helpful for us. All right. Uh, so different pools of capital, different uh, target uh, impact that you are really trying to achieve. And some of the themes uh, which is at the heart center of uh, your style of investment, like inclusive growth, sustainability, diversity and climate action. Neha, what is your firm mostly focusing on at the moment while identifying uh, the areas where you can create an impact with your investment? I think so. Uh... If you look at it, IFC and the World Bank work, we have very strong built-in requirements to promote inclusion, to promote impact uh, in any investment that we do, and also the advisory that we provide uh, along with that investment. Um, so it's a two-pronged approach. We have a targeted investment uh, program where we say, okay, these are the spaces, this is the kind of development agenda that we want to drive for the next few years. And as we said, it keeps evolving over time. And then we we support that with our advisory program to bridge the gap, the knowledge gap in that That's space. Right. Being, okay, today this is what is lacking from an international best, best practices perspective, from a industry best practices uh, perspective. So we right. kind of uh, supplemented uh, our investment program with our advisory program. Right. Uh, in terms of main themes that we're focusing on today, inclusion, of course, is one big theme. Uh, the other theme, as uh, Shini mentioned, is very similar, is gender, um, climate initiatives, sustainability. Um, in the financial uh, sort of institution space or the financial space, we focus on um, MSME loans. We focus on uh, lending to uh, affordable housing. Uh, these are some of the key sort of big uh, themes that we are focusing on. Yes. Uh, and to give you an example for gender, for example, and I can talk uh, closer to heart uh, the the work that we've done in the private equity space. Uh, we've we've worked with about twenty odd fund managers and co-investments in the last three years, and almost each of them have signed up. All fund managers have signed up to some gender uh, sort of benchmark, some gender commitments hmm. based on where they are today. Um, right. This implies, you know, this this effect amplifies. 
right? Because it's a private equity fund who's investing into 10, uh, 10 to 12 companies each. And if we're talking about 15 to 20 funds, we're talking about 200 companies indirectly signing up to this agenda. Uh, right. And that's uh, is one of the key focus areas for us. So you are an LP also in many of the private equity firms and they invest uh, on your behalf. And there again, you can bring about a change in terms of gender diversity and many other aspects that you believe in. But Neha, one question uh, that over 40% of your total investment in India last year was uh, focused towards climate financing. Uh, give me a sense on where we are um, when it comes to the whole climate action uh, theme and which are the areas that you're focusing on because there are various themes in that, renewables, EV and various infrastructure building. So where are you focusing on? I think our focus is across the value chain, uh, right? Depending on, and I think our focus depends on what is the requirement of our clients. Uh, we align ourselves to what our client requires, what our client's growth requirements are, where are they focusing on, where are they seeing the opportunities. We are at the end of the day enablers and catalyzers. As uh, Shini had mentioned, uh, we don't want to crowd out private sector. So we don't want to do something which is completely crowding out the private sector, but we want to attract more private capital and therefore we are guided by what our clients require. So one of the key themes that we focused on and we've done both direct investments and indirect investments to our funds is the EV space. Hmm. Uh, we back, for example, a fund manager, we've been backing them uh, for over a decade now, uh, GEF, South Asia, Green Energy Fund, uh, Global Environment Fund. And they've uh, sort of uh, invested in uh, an EV powertrains company. They partnered with some of the key uh, promoter groups, key industry groups in India, and hmm. said, okay, how can we solve this problem? How can we increase the penetration of EVs, which is 3% today? Yes. to 30% by 2030, right? So they've invested in this company, uh, in the EV powertrain uh, space. They've invested in an e-bikes company where coincidentally, we also uh, co-invested alongside this fund manager. Hmm. Uh, they are now, uh, they've just recently closed another investment, which another fund manager of ours is back um, in, the, uh, in the industrial EV space. So it's the the entire focus it's it's across different uh sort of themes across different spaces uh mm -hmm. based on where the requirement where what the client is requesting us for whether it's debt investment equity investment expertise uh, mm -hmm. however we can help our clients all right so creating the ecosystem there and um the ev space is what you mentioned as one of the key focus areas now Srini for uh, bii also uh, a huge amount of focus has been on climate-related commitment. You committed $1 billion up to 2026. Some part of it came in last year. You have a few portfolio companies towards climate-related like Ayana Renewable. Give me a sense of where you're focusing and where is the rest of the $1 billion going to be really invested and what are the opportunities that you're picking up which need your impact investment? Sure. Thank you, uh, Neha. I mean, if you if you try and look at climate, there are two main strands. One is to invest in transition finance where there is scope to scale and uh, and also bringing in the global commercial investors as a part of our mobilization theme. That is, of course, in the in the whole utility scale area, CNI, uh, and uh, and various other areas like water, PPP, et cetera. The other one is, of course, the newer themes coming into the climate like biofuels, green hydrogen, EV infrastructure like charging stations, battery swapping, battery recycling, these are still at a very nascent stage in the country. So, our, I mean, we also have a very active venture capital program through which we do we do a lot of lot of co investments uh, in in terms of climate tech, really. And VC funds, of course, uh, they play an active role in terms of uh, our, their their ability to bring in those opportunities to us. Where necessary, we also create platforms. We created uh, IANA, which was a renewable energy platform in 2018, which has got around five gigawatt today in terms of both operation and under under development, which is now, of course, a joint venture with Government of India and GGEF, etc. Now, uh, the second important thing, uh, which I the, the third important thing rather, which I I'd, I'd like to point out about is the whole nexus between inclusion and sustainability. You, I mean, we all must understand that climate change affects all sections of society, not just it's yes. rich or poor, it doesn't matter. 
So it's absolutely important we keep inclusion in mind while we are doing the climate change. For example, we use our climate innovation facility to try and provide insurance for smallholder farmers so that they're able to go through the crop cycle. We pay the premiums, and if the crop goes well post-harvest, they pay. If it doesn't go well, the premium kicks in. And we also provide uh, them with solar pumps where we try and sell the carbon credits to set off their dues. And we are also trying to do something like microgrids in many parts of Southeast Asia, mainly Indonesia and Vietnam, which help which helps them go for a living and ensure there is there is full power throughout the day. So inclusion and, and sustainability intersection is extremely crucial for institutions like us. And the final point I just want to make here is I think the most important thing is about how do we try and, uh, you know, the f food security is a very important point of what we try to do, which also has got climate implications, really. Silos, when we did a PP, uh, we did we did, did deal with a company which has, which does PPP with the Food Corporation of India, hmm. modernize them and reduce the wastage. Hmm. Food security is a very important part of for many emerging economies, given where we all must be aware of the fact that climate change is bound to be behaving differently than one can anticipate. Yes. And I think institutions like us can really help, you know, the, 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 the various companies and, and, and the growers to plan both in terms of cropping cycles and in terms of helping them go through the cycle itself and maximize their, their realizations in the hands of producers. Right, Srini, uh, you know, you accounted for some of the sectors of the futures, which uh, future because you identified some of the areas which are going to be very critical later. And as DFIs, you set the stage for it to be commercially viable for other investors to pump in money once the basic fundamental work has been done by the DFIs. Hold on to your thoughts uh, more on this interesting conversation after a very short break on Big Deal. Stay tuned.